Okay, well, um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be able to be your chair for this morning's um, final uh, day of the conference. The conference has um, obviously been quite different from what we would normally have hosted, but I have to say um, a huge congratulations to the team behind um, the Virtual Eden Conference. This year's conference has really, I think, gone out of its way to try to model what can be done in an online environment with not just the formal academic program, but also the um, other social dimensions to what happens during a conference. My name is Mark Brown, um, and I'm the uh, member of the Eden Executive. I work at Dublin City University as director of the National Institute for Digital Learning. Um, we've got a really exciting morning planned. Um, we're going to start with some very important Eden Awards to begin with. Um, those awards are um, something that we take a lot of pride in. We're going to begin with the Best Research Paper Award, and then we'll be introducing the Young Scholar Award, followed by then two really exciting keynotes. Okay, sorry I um, did a little talking over the video there at the outset. Um, for those who have just arrived, our numbers are going up, which has been um, great for the conference over the last few days. So I'm going to get started without too much further ado because we've got a tight program for the day. And um, so to get things underway, I'm delighted to introduce to you um, Professor Denise Whitelock, who's going to introduce to us today our Best Research Paper Award. Denise. Thank you, Mark, and good morning, everyone. It is a great privilege for me to be chair of the jury for the best research paper to, um, for this particular conference. We had a wonderful jury. And um, first of all, though, I'd like to make a special thank you to Ulrich Bernath Foundation for their support for this award, but more especially to Ulrich himself, who is indeed a real gentleman and was a tremendous support. As you can imagine, um, there is a high standard of papers that come forward for this conference, and the jury had a difficult position um, to make this time, since there were three excellent uh, conference papers which could have won the competition. We finally agreed on the paper which clearly addressed the 2020 annual Eden conference theme of human and artificial intelligence for the society of the future, inspiring digital education for the next STEAM student generation. So the award winning conference paper was Secondary School Teacher Support and Training for Online Teaching During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And this, the authors were from the University of Turin, and they were Celia Fissure, Marina Mashi Isu, and Sergio Rabellino. We would like to, the project was concerned with the training of teachers of secondary schools with innovative teaching methods and was concerned with the training of teachers during um, this period in these disciplines and during this difficult period of COVID. And also what's important here is that the paper elaborated on a rich pool of research and theory informed good practice, which could be transferred and applied anywhere so important in this particular time. So I don't know if we can do a virtual clap but it would be very good if we did so. So let's congratulate the award winners. I think they might be want to say a few words. Um, thank you very much. Um, my colleague uh, Cecilia Fissore and Sergio Rabellino and I are very happy for this award. And we want to thank the jury Eden, the conference chairs, and the conference program committee. 
In the COVID-19 um, pandemic, uh, we worked hard in order to support colleagues and teachers of the secondary schools. We put our knowledge, our competence, our passion for digital education and the service of the community. The research we have done in this period of COVID-19 pandemic uh, taught us uh, that this emergency can be turned in a very important opportunity for the future of education. A key point we bring with us after this experience is that uh, online teaching and uh, online learning are new paradigm. I would like to dedicate this award to all of my, uh, my research group. It's called Delta Research Group. Delta means digital education for learning and teaching advances. And if I can, in memory of my father, who died a few months ago. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, and congratulations to all three uh, authors. Also congratulations to um, all of those that were nominated for um, Best Paper Awards. And I'd also like to similarly extend a, a thanks to the judging panel and Denise for your role in chairing that panel. Um, for those of you who have just recently arrived, um, I'm Mark Brown and I'm chairing the session. Can I just remind you that please do um, introduce yourself and um, pass comments um, in the chat box and as we enter into the keynote phase, make sure that you use the Q&A um, option to ask questions that we will pose on your behalf. Um, our number of participants are building up in the morning here early on and um, we're excited for the program ahead. I'm also excited now to introduce the next part of the morning's um, program where um, Eden um, has been in existence for a long time and it depends on reinventing and regenerating itself through our Young Scholar Network. And so it's my delight to um, introduce um, Professor Joseph Durant who's going to introduce to us um, the recipient this year of the Eden Young Scholar Award. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. It's an honor and a pleasure also to me as a Vice President of Research uh, of EDEN present this uh, morning the EDEN 2020 Annual Conference Young Scholar Award. As you know, EDEN has always dedicated much attention to involve and motivate the future generation of stakeholders of the open distance learning field at first offering them visibility by rewarding their achievements. For the recognition of the academic quality of papers presented by Young Research, the EDEN Executive Committee decided to launch the Young Scholar Award. Since 2015, the award was bestowed to seven young scholars. This year, one junior researcher's achievement, as well as dedication to Eden Annual Conference has been recognized by the Eden Presidency. The winner's research was presented yesterday at the PhD Symposium. The junior research is also a co-author of two papers, two posters and two workshops. All these works are focused on the topic of the conference, Human and Artificial Intelligence for the Society of the Future. The Eden 2020 Conference Young Scholar Award is Francesca Amenundi from the University of Roma Tre, Italy. Congratulations, Francesca. Francesca, if you want to say something, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I cannot uh, start my video, but uh, I want to say thank you to everyone. I didn't expect this recognition and I am feeling very uh, happy about it. I wanted to thank you everyone uh, for this opportunity. The PhD Symposium uh, is uh, a very constructive opportunity for us to uh, uh, reflect on our PhD path. I wanted to say thank you to Timisoar organization uh, and of course to my um, uh, team at Roma Tre University because uh, all our research uh, are uh, 
uh, strongly interconnected than we are, a multidisciplinary team, uh, and uh, our research on critical thinking is, uh, sorry, is uh, strongly uh, multidisciplinary and interdependent. So I want to say, especially thank you to my supervisor, Professor Antonella Poche, who, who introduced me to the Eden uh, community. So thank you so much. Well, I think uh, it would be appropriate for us to, always, to also come in with a, a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. Congratulations. And thank you, um, Joseph, for um, facilitating the awards um, for the Young Scholar. Um, and uh, we always debate what we mean by young. Young is not in age, but in a stage of career in the context of that uh, particular prestigious award. Well, we're um, now time to turn our attention to uh, the first keynote that we have, the first plenary today, and I'm delighted. It's not the first time I've actually had the opportunity to introduce our um, first speaker. I'm, I'm going to hope I get my uh, pronunciation right, but you'll be able to help me out if I don't. Um, our speaker today, uh, to start off the program, is Gori Dimitrov. Um, and um, I'll give a little brief bio um, before we introduce your uh, particular topic of, talk of the presentation today. Um, he joined the European Commission in 2008. Between 2009 and 2013, Gori was involved in various roles in setting up the European Institute for in of Innovation and Technology, that's EIT. In 2014 and 2015, he managed and the launch of HE Innovate, an initiative by the European Commission and the OECD that supports um, entrepreneurial and innovative universities. I know my own university participated in the pilot at the time. He then acquired experience as a policy advisor uh, to senior management. In January 2017, Guri assumed the role of Deputy Head of Unit Innovation and EIT in the Director General's Office of EAC, where he's now responsible for the EIT, digital education and innovation and education, including business university cooperation. Before joining the commission, Gori worked um, in a leading multinational communications company in Germany. And prior to that, he worked um, for a software startup for four years in Germany. It's um, Notable that since Denise was with us um, in introducing the first award, that he also studied um, in a number of universities, but including the UK Open University, where he completed a B MBA in technology management. Um, Gori's going to talk to us this morning about towards the next digital education action plan. Um, I mentioned that this is not the first time I've introduced him, and those of you who are not aware, um, whilst I live in Ireland, I am originally from New Zealand, and there is a connection, um, uh, I believe, because your father um, spent time in New Zealand. So at this time, um, it's quite a good place to be in the context of COVID-19, but I digress, and the floor is yours to hear about, um, in particular, the Digital Education Action Plan, which is very timely, I'm sure you're going to tell us about about the consultation phase that's underway at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, thank you uh, for this um, very lengthy um, introduction of myself. I probably don't deserve that, that type of attention, but um, indeed, my father is still in New Zealand, and I think it's a good place to be right now. In any case, I am a true European believer, so um, I will go back to the European Union and talk a little bit about our plans. Um, before I do that, um, I will just put my uh, screen um, on and share it with you. Um, and the, the purpose of the talk today, uh, it's a new genre for me, the digital keynote. Um, so uh, the purpose of this is to introduce you to the um, next digital education action plan. But before I do that, first of all, I would like, do, uh, I would like to start by thanking the uh, Eden um, association for the repeated um, uh, invitation, uh, in particular uh, the president uh, Sandra uh, as well as the secretary general Andras, uh, whom I have been working also in the past. Um, I would like to thank you also because I believe that your 
association has uh, never been as important as it is right now. And I'm not saying this just because um, uh, you are called actually um, uh, European uh, Business and E-Learning Network. I mean, uh, it's not really about the heaven, it's more about the distance and e-learning that you are actually um, implementing so, uh, since so many years. And of course, I would just state the obvious when I say that this is right now um, absolutely the, the key um, a question which is facing um, the uh, management of the education continuity. I'll come back to that. Um, I also would like to say that I have been very impressed by, by what the Eden community has done since March. Um, I am on the newsletter list and I receive the updates of um, uh, the network and I am very much aware of the different webinars that you have been uh, putting online um, and really implementing the spirit of the, of the learning by doing uh, and showing the others uh, how to actually implement what uh, we have been uh, preaching uh, over the last, uh, I don't know how many years, and I don't really want to, to put a number because I know that many of you have uh, lots of years in, in experience um, in um, distance and uh, online learning. And I think that this is quite important also in view of the topic of the conference, which is, of course, uh, human and artificial uh, intelligence for the society of the future. Um, so. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the community for, for, for continuing this work and uh, in particular for mobilizing yourselves um, uh, in these in this very uh, difficult times. Then um, what I would like to, excuse me for, um, uh, what I would like to also say is that I want to congratulate the young um, and the other winners of the research um, uh, papers that you have just introduced. Congratulations from myself. I'm trying to keep up with what you are doing. Uh, I don't think I'm always very successful, but um, uh, this is a very important work and congratulations. And finally, uh, I want to congratulate, of course, the host or the physical host of this conference, which is the Polytechnic of Timisoara University, which um, celebrates its 100th anniversary. So now let me um, come uh, to the point, which is um, the next Digital Education Action Plan. And... Um, of course, um, I would like to start by saying that um, this is um, uh, a continuation of something that we have started, um, I would say, in some modesty two years ago, notably in 2018. And um, we started the Digital Education Action Plan uh, as one of the initiatives that would lead to the creation of the European um, education area. Of course, our purpose has been to um, support member states, you all know, uh, or um, if you don't, let me uh, state that, that the European Union um, has very limited competences in the field of education, so there is uh, not much that we can do. I believe we have done great things, nevertheless, I will just mention Erasmus here, and um, our role is to support member states and education institutions, and with the Digital Education Action Plan of two years ago, we wanted to do that in particular in the ongoing adaptation to the digital age. The scope of the last action plan has been on formal education, that is primary, secondary, and tertiary education. And um, we have chosen a focused um, approach with um, 11 actions across three main priorities. Uh, first, it is about making better use of digital technology for teaching and learning. Second, uh, it is about developing relevant competences uh, and skills for the digital transformation. And finally, something which is very important also for the Eden work is, of course, improving education through uh, better data, evidence, development, research, and, of course, foresight. Back then, um, we have set ourselves um, the objective to limit this action plan until 2020 for a purpose because we wanted to see whether it is a good idea, first of all, to work in this approach and try to have an integrated uh, action plan. So we have set ourselves um, a limit um, until 2020 to see whether we would like to continue or not, because of course it may have also been a bad idea. In the meantime, we have a new, um, now, uh, of course, uh, already one year uh, or so, uh, president of the European Commission, 
uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who already in her political guidelines has uh, set a priority uh, already in 2019 in the summer to actually update the Digital Education Action Plan and uh, in particular with regard to the need to develop digital skills um, for young people but also adults and um, the need to rethink um, education by using the digital uh, potential, um, making also learning uh, more widely available online and using different means of, of digital learning, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, online courses. Now, this sounds, of course, extremely trivial to the audience which, which is around here, and I recognize that, but let me say that um, um, this priority um, is something that has been defined by the President of the European Commission. And um, um, I think that it is an important step in the recognition of the overall importance of, of uh, digital education. So we have taken this, of course, quite seriously and started to work towards the update. And when I received the invitation from Eden about this conference, I happily, um, of course, accepted because I thought that um, Coming to Timisoara, first of all, would be a great experience, which I very much regret I cannot do right now. But secondly, I actually assumed that I will be able to present you the action plan, um, which was initially scheduled for adoption at the end of this month, more or less around the time we speak today. Now, in the meantime, we all know what has happened. And... Um, since March this year, um, of course, we have been hit um, very hard by the COVID-19 crisis. And what this slide uh, shows in arguably very small letters uh, is the impact on the um, closure of uh, schools or universities around Europe. Um, more than 100 million students have been affected. You all know what has happened. What is new is that this has been part and parcel of every household. And of course, um, the sudden and the large scale switch to uh, digital education, uh, including online learning and uh, distance learning, uh, but also remote um, emergency teaching, which is something different, of course, and should be distinguished, um, has been really at the forefront of the uh, attention of policymakers and also of policymakers in the um, uh, European Commission. So the um, impact of this is um, big. It is very early to say what it is exactly. I believe that uh, there is going to be a lot of research that will be and is already taking place. And I, I saw that the, the winning paper um, was actually addressing this topic, and I believe there would be even more research um, trying to understand what are the impacts also on learning achievement, what are the impacts on, on learning losses, what is the issue between uh, the situation as it is and the socioeconomic background. So these are all very, very big questions that have been, um, if you like, amplified and made clearer by the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And I think that um, with this sudden switch, um, that we saw in many places. Um, of course, we also experienced that not everyone was well prepared. Um, not every teacher or parent or, or, or learner or student was prepared for that. And um, um, I believe it is very important to not throw the baby with the, with, uh, if you like, with the bathwater and to conclude that digital education um, does not work because um, you know there are so many practical problems there. No, it is the contrary. It is very important to actually increase the attention to what can make digital education effective and um, of high quality. Um, with the crisis, the European Commission has gone into a crisis mode, just like any other organization around Europe, and. Um, in May, so one month ago, the European Commission has presented um, its uh, response to the crisis, which is called Next Generation EU. So just one month ago, the Commission has also taken the decision to put an unprecedented amount of 
um, money in the recovery plan. Uh, and this has also led to a rescheduling of uh, many different policy initiatives that have been planned for um, adoption, including the action plan. So one of the um, uh, reasons that we are not going to be able to speak today about the concrete actions is that we have had to adapt our planning and also, um, of course, the context of the recovery plan is here. Very, very important. Now, um, what are the key challenges that we have um, identified in this period? And maybe um, what I would like to, to do here is not to go through every single uh, bullet of, of those, but maybe um, to just highlight a few of them. And uh, as I said, um, from the perspective of the European Commission and the limited competences in education and training, it is important to see where are the big issues um, going forward and going forward with the next Digital Education Action Plan, which, of course, now will be much more addressing the questions that we have seen uh, being raised through the, through the COVID crisis. And the first very big challenge, and um, you will forgive me that I'm going to tell you nothing new here, but I think it is important to, uh, to, to, to say that and to also have it understood by everyone who is involved in policy making, and this includes finance ministers very, very often, um, to, to focus on the really big issues that need to be addressed. And the first one is the question of digital capacity. Um, digital capacity is something which includes um, infrastructure, it includes connectivity, um, it includes devices, um, and uh, it also, of course, necessarily includes the use of, of technology and of these devices. And I have here some statistics. None of it is new from COVID-19, but actually I believe this is making it even more pertinent because those problems have been there. They would have continued anyway. And what we have seen now is that um, they are way too serious in order to be accepted. So, for example, um, we know that there are very important gaps uh, which are related to the availability of computers and connectivity across Europe. And this is particularly uh, the case in low-income families, uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, remote areas, and uh, the geographical diversity of this across Europe is immense. Um, and needs to be addressed because unless we do that and the crisis continues, we will be effectively cutting off part of the population to a basic right, which is the right to access education. So this is actually quite important, even though it sounds um, often boring to speak about infrastructure and so on, but it is very, very important to take this uh, seriously we also know that um, when it comes to teachers, for example, I'll pick up another example that I have mentioned in this slide. Uh, when it comes to teachers, um, it is only 39% of them uh, in the EU that feel that they are um, well or very well prepared um, on digital education. And there are very many significant differences across countries. Um, in particular, right now through COVID, I believe we have experienced some massive shortcomings when it comes to the preparedness of educators to uh, continue <clears throat> um, education through digital means. Of course, this is very much varying from country to country, and we should uh, never generalize. Uh, in any case, uh, we have seen that um, we need to do much more and uh, we need continuous professional development um, uh, in this field for uh, teachers because we all know how important they are um, in, this, uh, in this field. So the first big question that needs to be addressed is how to manage the digital capacity, the, the, the lack of digital capacity, and to do it in a targeted way where it is necessary, and to do it um, with a view of those that are actually also using this. The second big challenge that, again, is nothing which is new, 
but again, is very much amplified by what we have uh, been experiencing and are still experiencing is the question of digital competences and um, the, the question of <clears throat> how prepared, um, of course, learners and educators are, but also more generally how prepared EU citizens are. And we know that um, uh, as early as uh, 2019, we have um, the, the, the DESI study, which said that 43% of EU citizens have an insufficient level of digital skills. Again, major disparities across the countries. Um, but this is, let's say, the general population. Now, if we go to something which is more specific to education and training, we also see that, for example, through ICIS 2018, we see that uh, more than one third of the uh, 13 to 14 year olds, which is the cohort um, of, of uh, pupils which is being studied there, um, actually um, uh, works below the, the lowest proficiency uh, level of digital skills. And if you look in particular at examples such as informatics education or computer science with other words and its provision across Europe uh, and um, we know that computer science uh, and computing um, is quite important to understand the fundamentals of the digital world, so it is not sufficient to use um, devices. Um, we see that um, only in 20 out of the 55 studied jurisdictions in Europe, we have um, uh, computing and informatics education on offer to all students. We have examples across Europe where you can graduate school and never have been exposed to informatics or computer science. So um, we should, of course, not say that uh, we, we have to develop programmers for the future only, but it is quite important to take the digital, uh, if you like, the laws of the digital world um, as seriously as the laws of the physical world, um, just like we take chemistry or maybe physics. Uh, we should be thinking about um, the digital world uh, equally seriously, knowing that lots of it is driven by algorithms, by uh, artificial intelligence, by things which um, uh, sometimes mislead uh, in terms of information, et cetera, et cetera. So the second big question here that we have seen exposed again and, um, and amplified is the question of how uh, are we doing in the EU in terms of the digital competences? And I would like to perhaps even go a step further and say the digital competences that we need for the 21st uh, century. And they can all be developed through education and training. The final big area which I would like to focus on in terms of the challenges that we, uh, that we have seen coming to the surface through COVID-19 and becoming really, really obvious is um, the question of, um, of course, on the one side, there is infrastructure and connectivity. On the other side, there is a, the, the question of the skills and competences. But this is not sufficient to make um, effective and inclusive digital education work. Um, what is necessary is, of course, a trusted digital ecosystem of content, services, tools, and platforms. And um, we have seen through the work that we are doing um, at EU level, but also with the um, consultations that we have with the member states, we have seen how important that question has become. Uh, many, many ministries, for example, uh, have um, uh, tried to facilitate access to different kinds of platforms, content tools with various results. Um, we have seen a lot of creativity and um, inventiveness on the side of educators, um, putting different things uh, very fast, of course, in this remote emergency uh, situation. Um, some of it worked very, very well. I would say some of it was perhaps um, more a question of, of, of a quick solution than something which is embedded in a strategy that, that uh, makes sense of, 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 um, of high quality education content, of secure platforms, of uh, services which are fit, uh, fit for purpose, and of course, uh, tools which are adapted to the learner who needs to be always at the center. So um, we know that in many, many countries, um, 
and uh, here there is a there is an example that we that we study uh, that we have uh, in the in the third bullet point. We have seen through a, through a recent survey that less than eight percent of the teachers uh, expect that we're going to go back to normal. So we are in this situation for a while, and um, we need to think about a way to make the different parts and pieces of the digital education ecosystem work. And um, last but not least. Uh, when doing so, it is quite important that we uh, pay attention to the questions of uh, data, uh, privacy, and ethics. I think that these are European Union also European Union values that we can um, take um, uh, into account, and we have to take into account um, when it comes to the question of privacy um, and. Um, uh, unfortunately, what we are seeing is that in an international comparison, um, European countries are still um, lagging behind, but um, the intention here is to, to consolidate and not to reinvent the wheel, but to have a more integrated approach and bring all these pieces uh, together. Now, these were the three main challenges around digital capacity, digital competences, and digital uh, ecosystem of content, services, tools, and platforms. And um, the action plan um, has been, um, of course, now um, rethought and is being um, in, the, in the process of rethinking, primarily because of what we have seen through COVID. COVID is a big, big challenge for everyone, but we see it as also a means to give an impetus to digital education. And um, our initial idea of starting with a small action plan um, will perhaps go through some revision, given the political importance of, um, of, the, of the issues that uh, we are discussing now. So what we are going to see in the, in the action plan is, first of all, a limited number of uh, impactful actions. We would like to focus on the areas where the European Union can add value. Um, and um, knowing that the competence is at the member states level, we are not going to intervene uh, and we cannot intervene in places where member states have um, their competences. And this is almost in all domains, but what we can do is we can support. Um, the focus areas that uh, we are going to likely see as, as um, the let's say the, the key uh, priorities are around the questions of um, capacity, um, which includes very much the technological infrastructure, but also the organizational capabilities around managing this. And um, I know that um, many of you are familiar with some of the initiatives that we have in the European Commission, just like Selfie, for example, which addresses the question on digital schools. Um, then uh, the question of digital competences for the 21st century will be a very, very important one, in particular when it comes to the role of educators and teachers. So we're going to look into how we can support them through our programs, uh, but also how we can develop the type of skills that would be important for going forward. And I mentioned some of the aspects, um, the intersection of artificial intelligence in education, um, which um, I cannot go into here uh, for uh, obvious reasons and lack of, lack of time in any case, uh, is going to be one issue that is quite important for us. We need to look only, uh, not only uh, backwards or, or what we need to, let's say, um, uh, speed up, but we need to also look forward uh, in terms of anticipating the changes which are coming to us. And uh, finally, of course, we are going to look into the question of how uh, education, quality content can be better promoted and supported? Uh, how can there be better guidance in terms of the two services and platforms that exist and how the European uh, countries can learn also from each other? Um, one important thing is that um, while the first Digital Education Action Plan was limited to formal education, we will likely see an extension beyond formal education to include also lifelong learning I believe that um, digital means, and in particular, if you think about reskilling and upskilling um, through digital courses, 
Uh, and uh, for example, there are great examples there um, that are, um, for example, uh, in the open universities around Europe, but also other means that offer this type of things to reskill and upskill. And um, uh, this is part of the bigger lifelong learning for us. Um, and we would also look into a longer duration of the action plan. This was one of the criticisms that we have um, seen that um, perhaps we have been a little bit too short-termistic. Uh, I think that now with the start of the next generation of European programs, which I remind all of us, uh, start next year, uh, Erasmus, uh, Digital Europe, um, we will have a seven-year cycle of programming that starts next year. We are going to, of course, see the Digital Education Action Plan as a um, policy uh, initiative which sets the objectives for some of these programs to support. And therefore, we're going to look into a longer duration also of the um, um, actions. Finally, um, we would um, need to, of course, look into the question of funding. Another question that is important for us, um, having critically reviewed what we have done so far in the last two years, and here we are going to look more into what we can do through Erasmus, increase its role, uh, when it comes to digital education, we already see a lot of interesting initiatives coming directly through, through the COVID, um, uh, let's say, crisis, which are accelerating. And, um, of course, Digital Europe program, but also other funds. And here I would like to mention that um, we will never be able to make a difference unless we can mobilize the member states to go along, especially those that need to do that. So it is very important that we work hand in hand with the member states. Finally, um, I would like to say that um, the action plan will be a part of the um, overall long-term objective of the Commission to support the digital transition in Europe. Um, our president has set um, two very important priorities for the Commission in the, in the mandate, and they are to manage the digital and the green transitions. And um, we see the Digital Education Action Plan as um, supporting the digital transformation in Europe of which education cannot be excluded. Obviously, um, again, it's a question of the member states primarily, but um, we need to see education as, as part of it. Um, as I mentioned, we will reflect very strongly the questions from COVID-19 and we will build um, where relevant on the current Digital Education Action Plan. We are looking at adoption in September 2020 uh, in time for the discussions in the Council. And we understand that the next presidency of the European Union, which is, um, which is the German presidency, is going to be um, addressing this as a matter of priority. And uh, as I mentioned, um, it is, um, all of this is part of the next generation EU recovery plan because we are in the middle of, of very, very difficult and challenging times and we need to, uh, to mobilize uh, all of us together. Um, you mentioned, Mark, uh, the open public consultation with which I would like to conclude. Um, because of the significance of the, the current crisis, um, I have adapted, first of all, my presentation, but that's not important. What is more important is that we can um, have everyone participating with their voices and um, expressing their views on what it actually means um, to have um, digital education, which works not only in, in, in current, let's say, uh, crisis terms, uh, short term, but also to develop a vision out of this for, for digital education, which is effective, inclusive. And it is for this reason that last week uh, we have launched an open public consultation EU-wide, which is normally done whenever um, major legislative uh, initiatives are, are launched uh, in the European policy context. And uh, we have launched this uh, open public consultation um, first, um, in English and uh, by early July, so next week or at the latest, um, within 10 days, uh, it will be available in all European languages. So um, it will be open until 4th of September. Um, 
it targets in particular um, a very wide group of stakeholders, citizens, parents, of course, teachers and educators, um, but also private um, sector. Um, there is the opportunity to distinguish whether you reply in your personal capacity or in your organizational capacity. And I would like to conclude um, this uh, contribution by uh, my genuine request to all of you to participate uh, in this consultation, be it in your personal, be it in your institutional, be it in your uh, organizational capacity, to make yourself heard um, in order to um, help um, all of us um, arrive towards um, uh, a more effective um, form of digital uh, education, which of course um, leaves no one behind and pays um, a sufficient attention to, to the need for quality, sustainability, and um, uh, to reflect our, our common um, future. With this, I would like to uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm very uh, happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to give you a, a round of applause there. Um, and um, I'm inviting people and reminding participants that um, if you would like to post some questions um, in the Q&A tool um, over the next 10 or 15 minutes, we will we'll have some discussion. Um, I'm going to start the ball rolling because uh, I have a particular interest, a research interest in policy as well as in my professional role in the way in which policy can be both enabling and constraining. And so um, I'm intrigued in many respects and would have to say that I would congratulate the Commission on the public consultation process around the Digital Education Action Plan. Many people uh, misunderstand that policy is as much a process as it is an outcome. It's not just the document that you end up with. So my question is, how are you going to take into account the uh, feedback you receive in any revised plan? Is there a way that you're going to be able to accommodate that feedback and share that back with the community? Yes, um, thank you very much for this question. What we are going to do is um, we will um, take uh, the um, input of the open public consultation, which I personally expect to be um, a very significant um, uh, amount of input, and analyze it internally, include it into the staff working document, which will go, is going to be part of the action plan. The action plan itself will be a shorter policy uh, document, um, but there will be a very significant evidence type of document attached to it to explain in detail all the different um, uh, issues that we are putting forward and the references. Um, and in this, uh, we are going to also include the result of the open public consultation. I would like to mention at this, case, at this uh, uh, occasion that what we are also planning in addition to the open public consultation in the next two months is a series of outreach um, let's call them events, for a lack of a better word, but we would also like to consult with um, the researcher community. Of course, the researcher community is, is very welcome to, to ex express themselves in the open public consultation, but we are also going to reach out um, in a targeted manner to the researcher community. Uh, we have um, a joint research center in the European Commission, which is working together with us, um, with excellent uh, researchers there. And we will also um, try to have a dialogue in a more focused manner with the people who actually understand the matters best. And I believe that Eden can be very well part of this. Well, thank you for the comprehensive answer and apologies to participants if that was uh, me putting my first question in. I'm going to turn in a second to um, some of the questions in the Q&A and remind you to post your questions there. Um, I think if there is one, if I could just respond um, before I introduce the next question, I think if there's one actually outcome that might be very positive as a consequence of COVID-19, it is this consultation process because policy, um, as we know, to be effective needs to um, engender ownership 
and ultimately needs to be enacted as distinct from being just symbolic policy. So I think the public consultation process and as you described, the focus groups that you're going to engage with will be really important in moving that step forward than just being something that sits there in Brussels as a, a nice plan but doesn't always get enacted at the country level. Um, so I'm very excited and pleased to hear that. Um, I'm also um, very interested to hear when you mentioned the first um, key priority around capacity um, and it links also into capability. So we have a question really around both capacity and capability. Those two things are different, but they interface is just what is required in terms of professional development for educators. Yes, ab absolutely. And I will try to briefly also answer the, the questions that are already in the Q&A, but I'll try to be brief in order to not take additional time. Um, so first of all, um, absolutely, capacity and capability, um, they are very different. If you look at them carefully, they work very well together, however. Uh, however. And I think that um, what you need there is basically um, on the one side, the, um, the, the questions around um, the right infrastructure, the right co connectivity, all of these things that need to be checked in terms of boxes. Uh, and on the other hand, you really need the organization, be it a university or a school or, or professional education organization, to be able to um, actually uh, work with this. And for this, uh, it is not necessarily only about the competences of the people, you need an institutional strategy. So actually you need, I would even say, institutional leadership that can drive this uh, type of uh, change because it is very, very different from the classical um, organizational model of an educational institution. So this is why capability always needs to be uh, addressed together with the question of how many computers we're going to put here or how, how much content we're going to produce or um, let's say what type of, um, of um, co uh, continuous professional development our people are going to go through. There needs to be an institutional leadership to guide this. And um, I personally would see the organizational capability question as, as, as addressed by that. Now, the, 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 some of the questions here that come um, um, are how we can include, how can we encourage government departments to make coding and digital competences part of the curriculum? I think that there are um, many, many excellent um, initiatives which are doing this quite well. I would go even one step further and say that um, with, um, with coding, we have um, a very nice initiative at the European level with the Code Week. But what we would like to see is that we go even further and um, start to understand better the fundament of coding, which is uh, the, um, um, the computer science and the, the informatics around it. I think that there is a big lack of this um, in terms of um, uh, provision across Europe. Uh, and we would like to encourage the ministries of education to share practices with, with each other and to perhaps think about um, how to better uh, prepare the students for this type of applications, which is the coding um, or other types of, of uh, applying digital skills. and um, we believe that it starts with a very strong and foundational knowledge about um, what the digital uh, world is. And this is provided through, through higher quality uh, computer science and um, um, uh, informatics education. The uh, action plan will um, uh, have actions that focus on primary, secondary, and higher education, to answer the question of Brita. Um, and, um, as I mentioned, um, it is likely that we are going to see an extension into lifelong learning, in particular when it comes to the reskilling. Um, let me mention that these are going to be targeted actions. I mentioned also that we would like to propose things that only add value at the European level, but um, they cannot be seen as in any way replacing or substituting the, the national measures. Um, when it comes to the monitoring, we are thinking of um, introducing a, a coordinated um, approach um, towards uh, monitoring better uh, how digital education evolves in the European Union. Um, I would um, like to stop here because this is a political question which has to be discussed um, more before we are able to present it or to propose it. 
but I remind that we are in the question of subsidiarity, so we are always depending on how the member states progress. Nevertheless, one can think of um, uh, assessing big, uh, big questions around education, including digital education in the context of the so-called European semester, which is the way of the European um, Commission um, uh, interacting with the member states and, and looking at their um, developments in selected pol policy, uh, policy areas. Um, I think that probably um, I rather, um, uh, yes, I, I agree very much that assessment and validation is a very, very big challenge. Um, <clears throat> to this, I cannot present any specific action right now, but it is part of our discussion to what extent we can cover it. Maybe here I stop. Well, thank you very much. Um, you took over my job very well by answering those questions in the Q&A. So, no, no, thank you very much. And um, I s hope I speak for others that I'm um, really encouraged to hear uh, the extent with which I guess one of the really positive takeaways of the challenging few months we've all experienced is the um, understanding of how we really need to engage and accelerate and perhaps even fast track the future of digital education. Um, and the, clearly the Commission and the Action Plan is going to play a very important role. So it couldn't have been a more timely presentation. I'm sure that everyone I uh, speak on their behalf um, found that uh, it was very informative. And again, I hope I speak on everyone's behalf. We look forward to engaging in the consultation process because we have an opportunity to shape our future here. And um, if people who are participants in Eden and this particularly long-standing and prestigious community can't influence the future, then who else can? Um, so thank you very much. And I look forward to further engagement. In fact, on a personal note, I know I have a meeting later this afternoon on the DigiEd hack, which was one of the uh, initiatives in last year's action plan, and I suspect is going to find its way into this year's plan. Thank you. Could you join me, please, in a round of applause? Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. I'm now going to uh, turn our attention to our second plenary this morning. Um, those of you who have arrived during the, the session, um, we've uh, started the day with two prestigious Eden Awards. We've heard um, about the Digital Education Action Plan and then over the last two days of the conference, there has been a particular theme around artificial intelligence in education. And I think the um, third uh, aspect to the action plan that talked about data um, is a nice segue into the talk that we're going to have. And um, I'm going to do my best to make sure that I can um, capture the pronunciation, but you may need to help me. Hacious um, Bodario. Good enough, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, Boticario is quite uh, Boticario. hard for you. I Thank understand. You. Um, okay. I'll do a little brief introduction to the talk and then hand over to you. Um, mm -hmm. Hesus has um, had several positions at UniEd related to using IT in education. He's currently a full, full professor of um, with the Computer Science School. He's head of the ADNU. Now, you might pronounce that slightly differently as an acronym, Research Group, a scientific coordinator in European and national projects, chair of the core conferences, and an organizer of the workshop series on user modeling accessibility. He's also an expert counselor at UNED's, UNED's uh, Center for Supporting Students with Disabilities and at the Corporate School Responsibility Chair um, you need and the scientific chair for um, of the Red Alter Nebita, um, which I'm not sure what that is, but you might explain to us. Um, he's authored over 200 research articles and participated in 26 research and development funded projects. It's a delight to um, have you here talking today on the topic of massive deployment of artificial intelligence at higher education institutions. And before I um, give you the floor, I will just make one personal observation. Um, I have been in the room, if you're in the room that I think it is, with the background um, artwork, and it is very impressive uh, there in Madrid. So very welcome, um, and we look forward to what you have to say. Okay, thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm, it's a real pleasure to enjoy this opportunity with you and I'm going to share 
some thoughts about uh, what is going on nowadays because it's the most, uh, you know, uh, this is a right nowadays, how to apply AI to everything. And uh, I've been working in this area for 40, well, 35 years already. And uh, well, I'm going to share with you some thoughts about that and as well the plans that we have at UNED. And in order to do that, I'm going to share the presentation with you. Hopefully, you have there. Okay, great. So, uh, in this talk, I'm going to reflect with you, okay? Because I think it's, it's a matter of reflection. It's not everything is so clear and technology uh, does not provide us all the solutions, okay? There are many open issues in providing um, a massive deployment or AI focus mm -hmm. on um, the most important thing that we all want, okay? Whatever the circumstances, which is to provide personalized learning, okay? So in, in this respect, um, the, the topics that I want to, to cover today is first of all to reflect with you some uh, things that we have to bear in mind in order to provide personalized learning services. Then I am going to review, not all of them obviously, <laughs> some of the developments in, the, in this area, those apply to uh, education, okay? with both sides, okay? We, we have to take into account both sides, not just the, the, the technology part, but as important as that is the methodology and how to be effective, okay? I'm going to reflect on that. And then we are going to uh, share with you, um, well, how happy I am because uh, we launched last year, most likely the first uh, global massive uh, plan for uh, spreading all the uh, services at UNED. Uh, using personalization and um, uh, support of data at UNED. And uh, we are we are on our way. I'm going to share uh, those uh, topics with you. So first of all, we are in 2020 and <laughs> the coronavirus uh, took place. And well, I don't know to what extent uh, uh, there to share with you that uh, to a certain extent, I feel that the, the approach that we have been having uh, at UNED, we are about to celebrate our 50th anniversary, is most likely one of the best ones, okay? We are uh, combining face-to-face uh, -face tutoring for those who uh, can afford them with online services. And everything is so flexible. Uh, there are so many opportunities that I think that the, the people uh, select uh, our university because of that. And bear in mind that we are a governmental university and we lack of resources, <laughs> obviously, okay? But nevertheless, I think we, we provide a flexible approach. So, uh, in this respect, yesterday I enjoyed uh, Anthony Camilleri, I think, talk, and uh, he reflected on something that happened everywhere uh, over this uh, coronavirus uh, confinement, okay? which is increased even more than 50% of the usage of uh, open courses. The same to uh, Dunet, okay? We, we have uh, already uh, uh, nearly 400,000 uh, students enrolled in our courses. This is very good news. And uh, well, also we, we suffered the consequences, okay? We, we had more than 60,000 uh, simultaneous uh, logins uh, sometimes. <laughs> This is um, quite uh, hard to support. And uh, we have uh, nearly 205,000 um, uh, sessions in, in, in several weeks. No, this is impressive. So first of all, let me share with you uh, some ideas about where we are, okay? Uh, my view is that higher education institutions have to be more focused on education than on learning, okay? Our classroom uh, resembled those uh, created back uh, in the old days, but not just in the industrial revolution, no, no. <laughs> way, way before, okay? Uh, perhaps in the uh, 1300s. And uh, well, our approach nowadays is not that different. <laughs> we just have uh, interactive blackboards. So, well, uh, Let's say that we are starting to take advantage of learning communities, and the approach is more or less like this, okay? This is what we, what we are doing, okay? We have students, all of them are connected, and all of them learn 
actually, if we don't provide them the resources, they will do uh, uh, anyhow. I mean, uh, they, they have, uh, we have discovered, okay, that uh, they organize their learning in, uh, outside of the university services, and this is something that concerns uh, all the universities, I think. And the approach of the tutor or the professor used to give, uh, used to, it, to give a talk, and, and I wonder if this is the right approach, okay? In my courses, I try to take this other approach, okay? Where I am just part of the community of learning. I'm learning from them. Of course, I organize the materials and everything and all the tasks, but I share with them the learning and I force them to share the learning with each other, okay? The tasks, uh, um, most of the times have, uh, most of the time have to be uh, share with others, and then we can learn from each other. And and I wonder if uh, all my lifelong working in this area, I'm I'm uh, chasing, you know, the 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 source of a rainbow, okay, which is personalized learning. And uh, to tell you the truth, the best approach is that one. There is no other. <laughs> there is no other. If I have the time to enjoy teaching just one person. I will completely understand uh, the person, their needs, and, and therefore I'm more helpful, okay? But the approach that we have, and this is <laughs> quite common, you, you can see this in many presentations, but I would like to reflect on that because nowadays there are some discussions about if this is the right approach or not, okay? Uh, which is to provide everyone the same uh, type of task. I, I don't like this approach, but even, even if I have to follow that approach, at least, what everyone agreed is that we have to provide different support to different people, okay? So this is what matters. And well, let's see if uh, machines help us in doing so. So, and now what? Well, first, uh, let, me, let me share with you some uh, uh, questions. And uh, uh, yeah, it's because um, I'm having problems in seeing the full screen. Sorry about that. Uh, the basic questions that I would like to share with you is, first of all, do we know what we are aiming at? I mean, uh, what we want in terms of personalized learning. Uh, is that really personalized learning? Uh, uh, sometimes I wonder that, I think that we haven't really addressed that issue. Imagine that you were able, able eh, to address everyone's needs in terms of technology. Are we teachers, okay, prepare, train to do that? Not myself, not myself. Uh, do you know, or we uh, know what the support uh, uh, has to be put in place? I, I have doubts, I have doubts. And uh, I'm going to share with you many things that people don't usually take into account in terms of what it means to provide learner-centered learning design. Well, that's quite hard. <laughs> and the topics, uh, well, finally, I'm going to share with you the topics in our roadmap, okay? So let me go back to the arrows. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is nothing but a cloud of words that you, you, you can take for my own uh, research group uh, publications, and you will get the same type of topics from everyone else in the field, adaptive, educational, learning, support, recommendation, modeling, collaboration, and so on. So, uh, there are background topics that uh, we don't usually uh, bear in mind, okay? And, and let me share some of those with you. Uh, the user experience is the only thing that matters. At least, uh, uh, if, if you really have in, into account the needs of everyone, as I reflect on later on. We have to provide open service architectures, and this is I mean, this is a staple nowadays, okay? We cannot uh, let ourselves uh, think that yes, one platform is going to solve the problem. No, never, never. We have to share all the different resources in a transparent way to our students so that they can even share their own resources with ours. Otherwise, we are out, okay? That's why they organize themselves elsewhere. <laughs> and uh, another important thing that we don't uh, really uh, build so much on is um, collaboration. There is a, a, a vast research in computer support, creative learning, and we don't take that into account. Another thing that concerns me and uh, 
is how we provide nowadays personalization to uh, our teachers and students. And it's most uh, focused on dashboards. And, and, and I have doubts that that's the right approach, okay? Uh, first of all, I don't have time as a teacher to cover all the different dashboards that I, I can access. I have to interpret them. There is a lot of research. I've been in, uh, um, in with Christina Conati in Vancouver University. They work on adaptive uh, visualization. And, and I can tell you, uh, the different ways of presenting data uh, changes completely the mind of the one who is receiving the information. So I'd rather have uh, uh, recommender systems that provide me the right, the right um, answer to the right question, okay? That flag me, okay, alert me that I have a problem with one particular student because that the student is um, trapped in whatever task or that we are having a problem in terms of how they work online in, in with uh, social network analysis. I will comment on that later on while they are working on our courses. No? And uh, lately, I've been working for over eight years already, more or less, on uh, taking effect into account, okay? It's quite surprising many times that if you bear in mind what the people feel is much more relevant uh, than what the people know because many times uh, there is a close relationship with, between both, okay? If, if you think that you are not able to do that and, and you feel uncomfortable, it is quite likely that, that you won't ever be successful and, 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 all, and vice versa. So, uh, one uh, of the most important things that I insist so much in my university and I have always uh, done is to use standards, okay? Imagine that we, uh, uh, we didn't take into account when we uh, have uh, connections, the distance between the railways, okay? We will have problems, we will have problems. So, uh, first of all, there is something that um, uh, many times we, we miss, okay? We don't take into account, which is the potential of the context. And we think that all the people study the same and with the same type of facilities. No, <laughs> there is no uh, longer the, the truth, okay? We have to bear in mind the, the new situations, okay? We, we could have a student that uh, is learning a lesson uh, trapped in a traffic jam, why not, okay? And, and there are people who are working together in, in another scenario, or there is only one that uh, have confirmed, and this is very important in terms of ethic issues, okay? to track them in order to help them uh, bearing in mind their effective problems, okay? And many other circumstances that I will comment. So this is called ambient intelligence systems, okay? And then we have to uh, take advantage to build on the diverse, okay? The diverse is not a problem, it's an opportunity always. And we have to uh, take into account in, term, in terms of uh, human-computer interaction, uh, user agents and assistive technologies. And we have to over, uh, to always comply with uh, those requirements, okay? Of those um, that are using uh, these devices. In one European project uh, that um, included 18 uh, institutions uh, in, uh, across Europe, we develop all the services that we can provide to a student with um, so-called uh, needs, uh, I would call everyone, but um, those with disabilities, okay? And so we can cater for them from the enrollment uh, to their graduation, okay? Not just uh, at certain moments, which is the evaluations and things like that, but on providing them a support and the, and the way they learn what, they, uh, what are their needs. And, and this is quite hard, okay, to develop. And, and well, we develop several prototypes and, and they work. Um, Sorry. Okay. Yeah. That, here you have uh, some papers on that if, if you want to track them. Uh, taking uh, the lessons learned from that project, uh, we are currently provided, providing uh, with the collaboration of the uh, Association for Blind People in Spain, the ONCEP, uh, several courses on how to develop accessible materials and how to take into account what it means public procurement, um, uh, how to develop accessible mobile solutions, and many others. Uh, you are welcome to use them, uh, are they available. 
Uh, regarding uh, collaboration, as I said before, many times we just um, consider what the, the forums provide us, okay? We have been working on, on more structured approaches to uh, using uh, collaboration so that the system, the system is able to manage, to control all the different sets and, and we don't have to concern, okay, as tutors or teachers on how to manage uh, that thing, okay? If we use um, different type of technologies like uh, machine learning and uh, social network analysis and open learning models, uh, we can let the system take uh, its own decisions, okay? In, in, the system is able to uh, 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 locate, to pinpoint if there is a problem with someone in terms of the connections that they have and how they have been working over the collaboration in different stages, taking, uh, of course, different roles, because it's very important when you are running that is uh, that you... Uh, um, take the role of uh, the coordinator, for instance, or the organizer of a, a group for study, and then you are just a member of the group. So it's very important to change those roles. And now I'm going to share with you something that <laughs> I, 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 I seldom uh, see in, in other um, speeches about how to deal with this, and this reflects what, what I have been learning huh, over many, many projects, is that how we develop um, online courses, okay? Now I'm a bit disappointed with the um, current flow of uh, teaching and learning that we have on MOOCs. I think it's quite poor, it's, it's not flexible. It's not really uh, focused on, on each learner, okay? So uh, we developed over several projects how to develop a um, system that were able to adapt themselves because they took into account, okay, the interactions of uh, people, the standards and all that, the, the topics I mentioned before, and, and adapt themselves for, uh, for the students. And that uh, takes a lot of effort, but uh, the good news is that uh, once you've uh, made the effort, you can uh, uh, replicate that in many courses, and this is very good news, okay, which is to uh, do the right thing at the learning design phase, uh, which implies also taking into account uh, those accessibility needs. You have the admin phase where you have to combine all the efforts, not yet, this is just one platform uh, approach, but you hear uh, the current approach uh, should be taking into account many different platforms and tools, and then they use it. And here you have to, to, have the, to implement the right tracking, okay? And, uh, and finally, an auditory process. This is very important because the auditory process has two types uh, of uh, outcomes, I think, okay? Some of them uh, uh, relates to the model, to the pedagogy, and some of them uh, relates to how uh, the technology has supported that. And, and those uh, has to feed back, again, the cycle for the next uh, season. Because it's quite difficult <laughs> for a teacher, I can tell you, to use several standards that we have enjoyed over the years in order to provide personalized learning paths, okay? In several projects, we took the approach of a planning system, and so the system is able to, with uh, major milestones that I am, as a teacher, able to provide to the system, the system was able to figure, figure out, okay, how to combine everything, uh, taking into account the evolution of everyone's uh, learning process. And here are more papers on that. And, uh, well, as I introduced before, I sometimes think that many, I mean, in many occasions, it's not that important the advice that you provide, even the system, okay, once confirmed that this is the right advice. But the explanation, something that is coming out right now in terms of using machine learning approaches, and I love it, okay, because I think that's the essence, okay, to provide the explanations why the system think something is relevant for you. If the systems tell you so, you get much more benefit uh, uh, in terms of those explanations that on the action uh, itself. And, and this relates to metacognitive issues that are so relevant at distance learning, okay? We have discovered over this coronavirus uh, crisis that uh, many of the problems that we were having with our students were psychological problems, okay? Not so much on uh, using this or that, but they were really under stress. They, I mean, 
uh, and we were well prepared. I mean, uh, we provide all of our services online. We have been uh, being the consultant in, in Spain, okay, uh, uh, to other universities that uh, were not used to this. Well, uh, in um, regarding uh, taking into account on board, okay, the affected issues, we have researched how to support uh, uh, the student, okay, and many times the text-based support ads are not that relevant <laughs> okay if you tell the student don't worry keep trying i think well it's better that than to say you made a mistake okay <laughs> but it's not a great support okay so we we are we are right now working in in different approaches i will share that with you and here are some papers on how to provide um uh the right type of recommendations over several projects and now we are working on, uh, well, I'm, I'm really intrigued on how this will uh, take us, okay? Which is to go and buy everything, everything from you. <laughs> and it's about to be there, it's about to be there. You just have to use your mobile and discover that it's tracking all the health issues around you. And this is going to be uh, more and more all the rage, okay? Uh, we have to take care of this. I will comment on that later on. It's not that I am so enthusiastic about this, okay? We have to take care of this. We have been using several types of uh, devices in order to get that information from physiological devices and as well from the behavior of the students in a particular context. And here we have more recent papers about it, okay? And so, and now what? <laughs> what? With what, I mean, what we are going to do at the university level, okay, in order to cater for all those needs, for all those open issues, and to learn from each other. That's the right approach, I think. Okay, the, the outcome is, uh, I mean, the, the starting point is to uh, start from the massive, which is the current situation, to the potential of massive, okay? And well, it is supposed that uh, in order to provide personalization, we need big data, eh, data and learning analytics. I, I, I'd rather I prefer uh, data mining applied to education because I've been here for so many years, but learning analytics. That brings on board the, the, the teachers. I have always uh, done so. So uh, I'm going to share with you how we are trying to go with all those things at UNEC, okay? We launched uh, that roadmap that I uh, mentioned at the beginning of this talk. And in this roadmap, we cover ethical and social issues, data gathering, data analysis, provide interventions based just on evidence, okay? Just on evidence. And providing the causes, of, uh, the, uh, the, the origins of those evidence uh, to the one who received uh, the recommendation or the alert. And, and put it in place predictive models in terms of those recommenders. The approach that we follow is user-centered. That's the one that we want to follow in all of our services. But first, first things first, okay? First, we have to be cautious. Me, the, the first of all, okay? Um, the first thing that we launched at UNED is a participatory process which was more focused on raising the awareness, okay? of what it means to deal with all data that is tracking me all over, okay, in every situation. And so we have to, um, in as much as we use that approach, we have to bear in mind the ethical issues, uh, the, the property right issues, uh, uh, access issues, and, and, and everything relates to that, okay? It's not just providing uh, basic stuff saying, okay, we follow the rules the uh, EU is providing us. It's not enough, it's not enough. If you go to the detail of those rules and you try to apply, you have a wide uh, gap to, to play with. And that's what they are doing with us, the, the corporate sector, okay, in terms of the solution. That's why in our uh, institution, we have developed, for instance, uh, a, a tool to provide um, all the evaluations right now are to net, okay, roughly 300,000, imagine, okay exams we have to, to run in this uh, couple of weeks. And we have developed our own tool for many reasons, but mainly, mainly for ethical issues, okay? Because we have to bear those in mind. These are the figures of the participation in that uh, participatory process. And now 
uh, with those guiding principles that we have shared with our university, we want to end up having official regulation that protect us as university and our students. Uh, the second step is data gathering. And let me tell you something that is a, the challenge, my main challenge as vice rector right now at UNED of digital, digitalization and innovation, okay? Which is as follows, okay? Uh, this university has, oh, has collected thousands, millions of objects even, okay? Of different sort in different areas. And the first thing that we have to do is to link it, okay? To provide a link of data of all that. We have to combine everything we have. We have to use the standards and the resources that has not be, have not been yet labeled have to, okay, for the benefit of everyone. Imagine if someone is lost in a course and just because there are materials related to what you are accessing at the moment because the system knows, presents you several presentations, um, uh, different forums, uh, comments on that, and many other uh, tool uh, facilities, that you don't have, you don't have to design as a teacher, but the system knows better than you. Okay. Well, uh, I think I'm running out of time, more or less. So I prefer to uh, go uh, more faster. Uh, in terms of uh, data analysis, we have to uh, improve um, what uh, we collect. Okay. Uh, many times uh, we don't take into account uh, the right inputs. Uh, there is, a, there is a, an interesting discussion on when we have to provide our students um, uh, surveys, assessments, and, and so forth. No? And, and we don't want to bother them, but their inputs are very valuable, and we want to have inputs that we can control and automatically manage. And this is quite challenging, okay? I already raised uh, the question of not being not so confident on the dashboard approach uh, to teaching and learning. And uh, the main issue that we are facing already at UNED, and many of you in other universities have this problem as well, is the dropout rates. Okay? And we have discovered that if we provide the right support to our students so that they end up going to the first sum, we are successful, <laughs> and this is very important. Okay, the first the first stage is someone in the university uh, that you know surround someone in the university um, have to be full of support, and that's what we are doing right now. And then to provide just interventions based on evidence. Okay, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, when I started working with Tom Mitchell in machine learning, I learned how cautious a system has to be before before bothering the user with anything. Uh, let me put it this way, okay? And those predictive models uh, have to fit each other, okay? And one problem that we have uh, always in our universities is how to start working with this uh, approach when we don't have information for our students. This is nonsensical. Let me share this with you honestly, okay? What do you receive? What do you receive when you organize a course um, in terms of your students, almost nothing, <laughs> almost nothing. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to teach a, a black box <laughs> and, and the only information they, uh, that I have is uh, the courses they have uh, passed and things like that. That's not enough if we want to address personalized learning. learning. Let me be honest with you, okay? So we have to take other approaches that machine learning can uh, cover up as well in terms of providing those services. And because I don't have really enough time, I'm just going to share with you one of the main developments that uh, we are uh, already uh, developing uh, Adunet, which is critical, I think, for everyone in any university, okay? The problem that teachers have, uh, faculty, is that they use a wide variety of materials, all of them from different sources, and the system wants them to have standards, uh, being interoperable, and so forth. No? And so we are developing uh, a, a generation of content tools that support their collaboration, support having uh, different information sources uh, in different formats and, and sharing them in others, uh, like EPUB, HTML, uh, common cartridge, uh, whatever. Okay, no problem. We have to cover all of them. And, and this uh, generation of contents dynamically is able not just to deal with generation of a particular content, but the whole 
course, okay? As uh, the, the slide I presented before that covered the adaptive life cycle, that's the approach, that's the final end of this. And finally, sharing, sharing, sharing with you. <laughs> I'm here to learn from your questions, okay? We are, or we are all here to learn from our colleagues in our university. It's incredible the things that we have found over the, the coronavirus crisis from them. They are doing great things and the people don't know that. And we want to share all that with everyone in, in, in collective uh, and common repositories. And of course, to provide and to increase the, um, the research that we are doing in this uh, area, I didn't mention because, before, uh, uh, but it's very important to uh, anonymize all the data that you have in order to incentive, okay, the, the research in this area, uh, leverage uh, the interest in developing new solutions, even develop uh, from uh, the, 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 the researchers, I do not in this case, and we are working on that, okay. And well, let me just end, end this talk with what the experts have shared with me in different conference, in the EDTU conference and in the ICD last year with Wayne Holmes, my friend. Uh, I, I, I'm very happy to work with him in these uh, uh, workshops. And these are some of the questions that the ex expert uh, shared with us, okay? And uh, if I am able to see them all, okay? First uh, question is, do we know the skills teachers have to learn to support personalized learning? Europe will be left behind if we get hang up on the ethics of AI ED. Other places, corporations will leave us in the shade. They ask for forgiveness, not permission. Well, just a question. Uh, degrees. If AI can enhance the student performance, uh, which one is graduating? Uh, will we still need uh, degrees? Well, perhaps there are good questions. So thank you, and let me finish with a uh, quote by uh, someone that I enjoyed so much in my early stages in AI, Marvin Miskin, in his book, The Society of Mind, he shared this with us. The art of a great painting is not in any one idea, but in the great network of relationships among its parts. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive uh, talk, I have to say, and um, I'm still trying to make sense and reconcile all of the points you raised, but three things stand out for me before we um, turn to the, some questions. One, I um, really appreciated your um, focus for some caution in uh, discussions around the role of AI, and I'm pretty confident based on the feedback in the chat channel. Secondly, that people appreciated your um, focus on ethics uh, in this context as well. I know that's a, a concern for many educators. And then lastly, you mentioned the importance of sharing um, because none of us have a mortgage, if you like, or um, understand where the future is going. And I guess that's also very relevant to the quote that you used there at the end, which also links nicely into your background because we stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us and we're um, part of a network. And, and um, Stephen Downs actually was mentioned in the chat box, uh, the concept or theory of connectivism is often cited as a extension of that kind of knowledge network. Um, we do have a question, only a single question now, but I do have um, one that I can pose as well. But the first question I think is very relevant because you started the talk um, with a very strong focus on personalised learning. Um, and I also appreciated that you put that as a question as well. Uh, what do we mean raising? So the question is in a similar vein. Do we actually know if students actually want, enjoy, prefer, and learn better from personalized learning? How would you respond to that? Okay. We would like to. We would like to. And we have uh, many times tried, Adunet, to bring them on board. They just don't care. You follow? They just don't care. They are so used to not receiving support by anyone 
that they organize themselves. And this is the first critical issue that we have to face. <laughs> exactly. How to bring them on board. I, I, before providing solutions adaptive to different types of topics, that's another thing that we are doing at UNED, okay? The courses will be different, of course, in computer science than in uh, zoology, uh, philology, imagine, no? Uh, the, 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 the type of approach that we are following, which is to provide white, one size fit all, <laughs> I mean, it's nonsensical. <laughs> it's nonsensical uh, whatsoever. So uh, the, the thing is um, to have their say, and, and the problem is, it comes from early stages. Um, I have uh, launched a European project with many, many important people, thanks to all of them, uh, more focus on starting at the right time, which is not at the university level. You understand? Not at the university level. This is just another step in the ladder. But if we start building the house from the roof, <laughs> we never, never be able to address the problem fully okay we have to take into account everything of course the the current uh, puzzle uh, pieces that we have have to be in place eh? it's not to uh, uh, forget everything but the first problem that we have is that the information that comes from one level of the education to the next is almost nothing nothing and this is terrible because i have uh, uh, suffered the consequences with my own kids one of them is very very brilliant as her mother <laughs> and has just end up uh, first uh, class uh, the degree in uh, genetics in 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 glasgow and uh, this brilliant uh, person who happened to be part of my family uh, and i've enjoyed uh, her learning uh, has always you know puzzle the teachers okay because they didn't take into account that my kid was brilliant. And therefore, over and over again, every course, we have the same problem. Okay, oh, thanks. I, I would like to thank your daughter because she interrupted me, interrupted me okay, when she was uh, uh, seven years old, so imagine. No? And, and when I discovered that if she didn't understand something, I better address that because no one else <laughs> was able to understand uh, what I said. I, I'm very thankful, and so on and so forth. You, you, you understand, no? The, the thing that I'm trying to introduce here. We have to have more data, more data on board. We have to have them on board, because data is just one part of the truth. People don't realize, because nowadays we, we, we live, you know, in such a world that we imagine that AI is going to solve everything. I've been working in this area for 30 years, and well, I won't be here for the 30 next years, but I can tell you, all the, the, the main issues that are open will be open, will be open, okay? And it depends very much on us, on how to take advantage of the technology. But bear in mind, take advantage of the technology for something, not the technology apply because it's so flashy, okay? No, never, never. Okay, technology, for instance, nowadays, I, I, address, I, I went to a course of in, uh, teams, uh, sorry, um, um, Power BI, BI, sorry about that, okay? Uh, a tool in order to apply business intelligence at UNED. And the system provides you something that they call insights, wonderful insights. You don't have to know anything about data, about how to combine data, about anything, okay? You click and you get an insight. And I was wondering, okay, and what support that insight? Because I work in this field and you have to uh, prove, okay, that that insight is true, okay? There has to be significantly uh, uh, statistically relevant and many other things that have to be in place, okay? They have to be, the models have to be precise they have to tell you what is the data that was involved and all that. No, that was hidden. It was on the Microsoft side. Okay. So <laughs> I'm losing the best part of it. I'm losing the best part of it. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive answer. I, I have a follow up question um, linked to personalization. I'm wondering uh, do you see that there is a tension between the goal of personalization? and the need for standards or standardization? Uh, I cannot be more on that side, okay? It has been my battle for many years because it takes into, into account having to deal with many 
for a, for someone who is focused on res focused on research like me, managerial things. Okay, <laughs> let me uh, be honest with you. Standards are very important, but we have to, uh, you know, come up not just with technological standards. No, we have to come up with ethical standards. Okay, we have to come up with right approaches that we can share and evolve so that they end up being like a staple, staple for you know progress in the field. So standards is a magic word that covers many things, but one, one thing is clear nowadays, okay? In order to share, we have to comply with the standards. That's it. Well, that was a nice short answer. And I guess what I often talk about is, and I know Diana, I'm going to bring you in in a second, but the iPhone that I have in my hand, if that can be seen, is an incredibly innovative piece of technology, but it is also built on standards. So the two can be reconciled. Um, to finish up, I'll just make one observation and before I invite people to congratulate you on a great um, and insightful presentation, I think I'm right in assigning this sort of metaphor to Stephen Downs around um, personalization, where he um, points out that a lot of what we're doing in the concept of personalization and using a restaurant metaphor is just changing the menu or adding more items onto the menu where real personalization involves getting the, um, the person who's attending and about to eat a meal to actually be the ones who cook the meal and choose the ingredients, a much deeper layer of personalization, perhaps even to go and find those ingredients. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask everyone just to join me in a round of virtual applause. Um, we've had a, a really interesting morning for the final day of the conference. And I'm now going to just hand back to Diana, who's just going to tell you a few things about um, the rest of the day, I believe. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Georgi. Thank you, um, Jesus. And thank you very much, Mark, for wonderful start of the day. And I will now uh, start sharing my screen. So we move immediately to the to the closing because we are a tiny bit late according to the to the schedule. So. Uh, please, um, if you want, yes, this is it. Um, this is uh, the forum in the conference tool where you can put information about the social events, your project, and also about the papers. It's not so much action here, which we were hoping it's going to be, in fact, as uh, to be able to share some information about other EU projects in which you are working and to create the Eden 2020 community. But uh, what I will drag uh, your attention today is about the social event yesterday, which uh, was wonderful. We had some uh, great food and some nice chat and some music, and we've seen about the cultural festivals of Timisoara. So you will be able to still go and have a look at that. And we posted some photos and uh, things also on social media. And today we are celebrating the Romanian Midsummer Day, I think in a lot of Europe is also a large celebration and also the Romanian blouse, so the thing which I'm wearing now. And we put here some links to some of that information and you will be able to, to read that uh, and to see also the video and so on. Uh, I would like to, uh, to um, draw your attention to the schedule today, which is also quite busy. There are a lot of papers which are following and sessions and there are some several very interesting and very good ones to, to be seen. It's also the synergy uh, session, which is happening later after uh, at one o'clock uh, Brussels time, which will show you exactly how um, you can, how to say, uh, look into the European Union project. Because quite a lot of people have been asking about the, the attendee list and the speakers list. We created last night, uh, a new list so you can see those which are speakers and those which are attendees so you just need to go into the front page on the conference tool on eden and then you will be able to see and you will be able to interact with everybody and we prepared in the closing plenary but you can try it from now uh, several information about where is the new research workshop in uh, in lisbon sorry for that misspelling and 2021 in Madrid. 
but also how you can do your participant photo. And I will briefly go over this. So you have uh, a, a slide share, uh, Google slide share where you can have all the instructions on how to put your uh, photo into this PowerPoint. This is shared with everyone and you can bring it there and then you will be able to create something like this or like this. There are several images which you've been accustomed of them now and you will be able to use that and you will be able to see them like this and save them and use them. This is going to be your memento of Timishwara. So you will be able to use it also in social media and in other profiles where you have it that you've been to Timishwara and you will be able to do it. So everything is shared and it's the information you find it into the closing plenary where you have the instructions on how to do it and so on. So please follow up uh, the day uh, with the information and uh, you can now see the attendees and the speakers and please uh, post information into the forum about the EU projects and either other ideas which you have so we can enhance the community also further up and uh, more information also into the closing session. Thank you and join the sessions now please. Thank you very much to all. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Diana. I hope I didn't run over time there. My notes said uh, 11, 10.45, so um, I was yeah. working on that basis. <laughs> the initial schedule was 11, uh, 10.30, so that's why, but it doesn't matter. The other sessions are open now and people are moving there, so it's perfect, don't worry. Thank you so much to everybody, and uh, thank Georgi and uh, Jesus again. Bye. Thank you, Marina.